the Joe Rogan experience. People think about overpopulation. One thing that you should take into consideration is that as populations uh, increase and places urbanize, the actual birth rate goes down That's right. to the point where places like Japan, there's actually a concern that they're not having enough children. That's right. Yeah. And of course, it is driven by prosperity, and, yes. you know, female education and emancipation mm -hmm. and so on. Yes. So at this point, Careers. if you look at the largest countries in the world, the largest dozen countries in the world, the only one that has a really high um, fertility rate still is Nigeria. You know, if you exclude sub-Saharan Africa, it's basically a completely solved problem. Really? Mm -hmm. Nigeria is the only one. Yeah, if you look at the big uh, the countries you would not expect, like Bangladesh or Pakistan or India, you know, their fertility rate is down below three now. Really? Yeah. That's interesting. So their population will level out over the next few decades. Well, it has, yeah, it's going close. I mean, it's, it's still declining. You know, it's mm -hmm. plummeting. You know, people often used to say that the only reason why China's fertility rate is low is because of the one-child policy, which, of course, they have now discontinued precisely because of problems like this. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not true. I mean, other countries were a little bit behind. The one-child policy did certainly accelerate the process. But if you look at Brazil or Indonesia or any of these countries, you'll see exactly the same phenomenon plummeting. Have you thought about what the future looks like when people lived to be four or 500 years old? Like, how? first of all, how wise will people be? Mm -hmm. That's what's really interesting because... So, Okay, so here's, here's a really important thing that I want to get across. When we think about longevity, well, actually, three things I want to say. First of all, longevity is a side effect of health, right? Right. So, you know, a huge amount of the so-called debate that goes on about the desirability of all of this just goes away when you remember that people actually quite like being healthy. But in terms of how the world will be, which is a question you asked, there's two questions here. One question is how will the world actually be? And the second question is how will people in the near term expect the world to be? And the reason why those two questions are, are important to distinguish is because the question of how the world will actually be is very obviously completely unanswerable, even if we look 50 years in the future. I mean, if you look 50 years ago, right, how much of what we have today would have been predicted, right? Yeah. The world is completely different. And certainly in terms of longevity, you know, we're only going to be getting older at one year per year. There won't actually be any 500-year-old people for another 400 years, right? Oh, really? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean... <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I don't know what you're going to be able to do. <laughs> you, you we think we're funny. not going to be able to change the, pa change the rate of the passage of time, is my point, right? I understand what you're right. saying. Right. But expectation is a completely different thing. And here's why that matters. There's going to become a point, there's going to come a point where people in general, the general man in the street, starts to realize that they're probably going to live an awfully long time because they're not going to just get progressively sicker as they get older. And, you know, lots of other reasons are going to exist why they're going to live a long time, like we're going to have self-driving cars that pretty much eliminate, you know, road accidents and so on. So they're going to want a lot of different things than what they wanted when they thought they were going to live only slightly longer than their parents. They're going to want very different pension plans, very different life insurance, health insurance, very different inheritance arrangements. And these are huge, big-ticket items, right? They basically drive the global economy. So policymakers and decision-makers around the world had damn well better be ready for that shift in public expectation of how long they're going to live, right? Yes. Now, therefore, it is absolutely critical to estimate and to communicate the estimate of how soon that shift in public expectation is going to occur, which means how, well, what events have to happen, how much progress needs to happen in order for that, in order to in order to cause that shift. Now, this is where I am terrified, because I think it's going to happen really soon. I think it could easily happen in the next three to five years, and that when it does happen, it's going to happen incredibly suddenly. Here's the sequence of events that I think is going to happen. Step one we're going to have sufficient progress in the laboratory or the clinic that most of my scientific colleagues 
are going to be willing to come out and say, more or less, yeah, Aubrey de Grey was right all along. They're going to say, yeah, you know. It's You're a- very excited about that. No, I'm terrified, and I'm going to tell you why. You're a little excited. A little well, excited. I mean, I know I have been. A, 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 <laughs> no, recognition is never okay. something that's driven me. Um, um, but, yeah, they're going to they're gonna come out and say, yeah, it's only a matter of time before we lick this aging thing. Now, what do you think is going to happen next? You're a media guy, right? Here's what I think is going to happen, but I want, your, uh, I want to know whether you think I'm right. Okay. I think the next thing's going to happen is that real opinion formers, people like you, people like Oprah Winfrey, are going to hear that being said and written you know, in the media, and they're going to say, oh, shit, this is actually going to happen. And they're going to say so on air. And they're going not only to say, say what their opinion is, but they're going to say what they think people ought to do. In particular, they're going to say, well, look, you know, let's actually, if, we're, if, if it's only a matter of time, that, and if we're losing 110,000 people every day worldwide to this phenomenon, then we do kind of have a bit of a moral obligation to make it less time if we can. So my sense is that once that happens, the following day, it's going to become impossible to get elected unless you have a manifesto commitment to you know, have a war on aging, you know, pr- throw proper money at this. I mean, I really mean a proper war on aging, not just like the war on cancer was. Lots of money. Not just to do the research, but also to front load all of the investment in infrastructure and, you know, training of medical personnel and so on. Okay. And everyone's going to know it. Like the world, the public is going to make that switch I just mentioned of expectation, like at once. So it's going to be ridiculously sudden once it happens. And the first step is going to be that shift in what my colleagues in the biogerontology community feel able to say on camera and on stage. Now, therefore, the question is, what amount of progress is going to be required for that to occur? Now, here's the thing. There aren't very many of us. It's a small field. The number of people at the top of the field who actually talk to the media quite a bit is, you know, a dozen maximum. There's me, there's David that you've had on the show. There's, you know, very few others. And we all know each other. We're all good mates, right? So we know exactly where our heads are, you know, what the drivers are. The number one reason why my colleagues don't already say what I say is funding. The fact that unlike me, those people are reliant for most of the money that drives their research on peer-reviewed government money, government grants. And they just won't get them if it's possible to accuse, those, accuse them of saying irresponsible things to the media, things that get people's hopes up unduly. Remember, there's, hardly a, there's, there's nowhere near enough money. There's less than 10% of the necessary money to fund research at the moment. So the committees that decide who gets money and who doesn't are always desperately scouting around for reasons to say no, Mm. that can be justified. And saying, oh, this guy says irresponsible things to the media is a totally safe way to say no, right? So anyway, so this this is the problem. This is why my colleagues have to be really pretty curmudgeonly. Even David, David is probably the person out of my colleagues who pushes the envelope as much as possible out of people who have regular faculty positions. But, you know, he's just written a book, which I see you have on your shelf, Mm -hmm. called, you know, uh, Why We Age and Why We Don't Have To. He could not have written that book with that title five years ago Mm. and kept his job. Wow. Um, So, you know, the question is how much has to change. And actually, it's not very much. You know, there's a balance here. There's 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 a tension here between... On the one hand, not saying things that can be characterized as irresponsible, but on the other hand, not saying things that can be character- characterized as simply untrue. <laughs> like, right? So the more progress is made in the laboratory, not even in the clinic, just with mice, right? in terms of actually you know, rejuvenating them, making them live longer with treatments that were given to those mice when they were already in middle age. The more progress is made... Um, you know, the more impossible it's going to be to carry on being pessimistic and refusing to, uh, to, to make time frame predictions or anything like that. So there's a, almost a forced pessimism Correct. that's created by the establishment. Correct. Well, I think what you're saying makes a ton of sense in that once it does get 
to the point where this is undeniable, this is peer-reviewed, proven, established science, and also implementable. Mm -hmm. This is something that can be at scale, mm -hmm. distributed worldwide. Yeah, things are going to get real weird. So people are already, people are obviously still going to be saying it can't be done in humans, you know, can't, right. it can't really be done, you know, until the cows come home. You know, yeah. just in the same way as has happened for any other pioneering technology throughout history. But what matters is what the center of gravity of expert, at least ex stated expert opinion is. It is a really, really polarizing subject. I mean, it, it is funny how what you're saying rings so true that academics and intellectuals have to be cautious about talking about even what is potentially possible, even though in private they probably are more than aware that there's just a few steps to go before this stuff gets implemented mm -hmm. and we see really catastrophic, I mean, really spectacular, rather, changes. Yeah, and I mean, I'm not saying that all of us absolutely agree on 100% on everything in the science. Certainly, I would say that I'm slightly on the optimistic end of the spectrum of expert opinion. But yeah, my colleagues are not all that far behind me in, that, in terms of what they would say the time frames are. What you're saying in terms of people discussing it in the media makes absolute sense to me, that as soon as that, that Pandora's box gets opened, then people are going to be looking to establish clinics everywhere, and it's it could be very strange. Well, even if even if even if a lot of these things are not yet available for clinical use, even if some of them are still at the beginning of the clinical trial process, and we're still maybe ten or fifteen years away from the real McCoy, you know, that will still be enough to trigger this pandemonium. Mm. And that's why policymakers, decision makers in everywhere, and both in government and in key aspects of industry, need to, I, I call it, anticipate the anticipation. They need to be, have already thought through and prepared for this change in public expectation of how long they're going to live. So you think that this uh, one day will be a gigantic public issue in terms of elected representatives that they, they're going to need to have some sort of an anti-aging policy? Mm -hmm. That's right. And the switch from essentially situation normal, you know, business as usual, to this completely new world will be ridiculously sudden. It will happen in a week. 